We are continuing our Outlook 2022 coverage from our Vancouver studio. And joining us next is Alex Mashinsky, CEO of Celsius Network. Alex and I will be discussing the outlook on cryptocurrencies, gold, the US dollar, and the state of the US economy in 2022 and beyond. Alex, of course, is well known in the crypto space, but he had a very long career as a tech entrepreneur, being one of the founders and creators of VoIP technology, voice over IP. So we'll also be discussing the state of technological innovations around the world. Alex, it's good to see you again. Thank you for joining us. Hi, David. Great to be with you. Great to be with you, too. Last time I spoke to you was not too long ago. We were speaking in person in Miami at the Decentral DeFi conference. Uh, this time we are not at a conference, but uh, our conversation will be lively nonetheless. We'll be talking about your outlook for the following year. So I'll start by asking you what you think are the major investment themes of 2022. Yeah, so obviously we're seeing uh, uh, plans for tapering. It's not tapering yet, but just plans for tapering. Uh, also plans for maybe higher interest rates. Uh, so money is going to be a little bit harder to come by. Or uh, this new corona variant may uh, scuffle all of that and we will have even more uh, money printing next year. So really, uh, we are at a cross in the road and, and no one really knows which way it's going to go, right? So... Uh, the U.S. Uh, has been very accommodating, right? Uh, um, which helped uh, with our uh, growth, gross domestic product, and it obviously helped the crypto markets as well. Gold is the only uh, kind of asset class that's been going sideways, waiting for some resolution here. So I think for next year, we really have to wait and see, uh, see what happens with uh, with COVID, see what happens with the consumer, what happens with the Fed and what treasury slash uh, the political uh, machine is gonna do out of Washington. So Alex, some economists have posited that the higher asset prices we've seen in 2020 and 2021 were a result of higher speculation activity from excess liquidity uh, by the Fed. If you're saying that next year, due to either tapering or interest rate hikes or both, um, we could have less liquidity in the system. Does that not imply that we'll have less speculative activity as well? It may, really. It depends on uh, uh, what's going to happen to tapering, what's going to happen to money printing. And, uh, you know, I think uh, on the early signs of a slowdown, early signs of uh, 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 shutdown or uh, slowdown economic activity, I think the Fed is going to reverse course. And then uh, uh, risk assets are going to do well again. Uh, but if uh, we're seeing inflation continue to rise, we're seeing the Fed uh, really locking the horns with inflation, trying to put it back in the Pandora box. And then uh, I, I think we're going to see asset classes, including Bitcoin uh, and gold, uh, actually take a hit first. Mm -hmm. And then they may recover and uh, uh, go higher. But I think everything is going to take a hit first if tapering and, um, um, you know, the the uh, the yield prices or the, you know, the interest rates are going to rise. So that's why I'm saying you have to wait uh, uh, for at least a few more months to see which way uh, the economy is going. So uh, the labor uh uh, monthly numbers are very important. Inflation numbers are very important. And, uh, uh, you know, money printing, like you said, the Fed printed 40% uh, of all the dollars that existed in the last 18 months. The stock market is up 40% in the last 18 months. So, so those numbers match for a reason. And because most of that liquidity is coming from the Fed and Treasury into financial markets, and not necessarily into Main Street. So would you characterize next year's theme as more risk on, a continuation of risk on activity, or more risk off? I, I, I think we will have uh, volatility, and because of volatility, um, if there's a lot of volatility, because, for example, inflation is out of control, double digits, then um, gold and Bitcoin are going to become even bigger, safe assets. Okay. Uh, but if if we have single digit inflation and the Fed is fighting it, then all assets are actually going to lose value because everybody is going to be hurting. 
And, and the opposite, if, if the Fed uh, decides that inflation is not an issue and they can accommodate longer, then all asset prices are going to go up. So we have several scenarios here. And we have to watch very carefully what happens with each print each month and make decisions based on that. To your point about the U.S. dollar, more dollars were printed last year than in any other time in history. Were you surprised at how strong the dollar has been maintained despite higher inflation, despite more money printing, and despite monetary stimulus? I, I wasn't surprised because the, the dollar is the reserve currency of the world. And it is the best looking house in a pretty bad neighborhood, right? So if you are, uh, if you have Turkish lira, the dollar looks amazing. If you have, uh, 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 if you live in Venezuela and Argentina or any of these other countries that are struggling with their local currency, uh, converting your assets into dollars looks like a smart move. So because of that, uh, because of the risk, the increase in risk in many fiat currencies, you're seeing mass migration to the dollar. And because of that, the dollar is strengthening, uh, despite the fact that the United States is printing trillions of dollars. And the secret, the secret to the US uh, power, the US success, is the fact that we can continue printing dollars and not have the dollar collapse mm -hmm. because the rest of the world, we have, the United States is 5% of the population, but about 85% of all the transactions in the world. That is really the secret to the power of the US dollar and the military is here to protect, the US military is here to protect the US dollar. Don't, don't com get confused with the US military protecting the US population. Wow, that's a, can you expand on that? So they're not, they're, they're more interested in protecting, well, that, that, that goes without saying, that, that kind of applies to any country, does not? Well, if you look at the deployment of where US troops and, and, and uh, uh, air, 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 you know, Air Force carriers and so on are deployed. They're deployed, for example, to protect the oil region. They're deployed to protect Taiwan. Places like that that are economically important for the uh, maintain uh, for maintaining the U.S. dollar as the reserve currency, the petrodollar, uh, international commerce, and so on. So again, you're not seeing uh, uh, these troops being deployed to protect our border with Mexico or border with Canada, right? So. So I think most of the U.S. might is here to protect the economic machine. It's a good thing. I'm not saying it's a bad thing. I'm just explaining that it's here to protect the economic machine where mo the United States gets a free ride from the fact that most of the world is using dollars to transact between all the different countries. I've watched your debate with Peter Schiff not too long ago, hosted by Michelle McCory. A uh, great debate, by the way. So your, your, your counterpart, Peter, had made some good points about the U.S. dollar. His position shared by other economists is that the U.S. is on a secular decline, and with it, uh, a secular decline of the U.S. dollar as, as the world uh, reserve currency. Can the dollar lose its status as a world reserve currency? Can we lose uh, the petrol dollar into something like the petrol yuan or anything else? And to your point about 85% of the global trade being transacted in U.S. dollars, is that going to last forever? I agree that long term, you know, we don't know if it's going to take 10, 20 or 50 years. Long term, we are, uh, there's going to be a decline. You cannot continue. You know, the analogy I was doing, I was saying is that the U.S. dollar is like this golden uh, goose that lay golden eggs. And what the United States does every year, we pluck a few feathers, we throw it out of the fifth floor and see if it can still land. Right? And then we bring it back, let it lay a few eggs, pluck a few more feathers, and see if it still lands. Right? So printing dollars continuously and hoping that the goose will continue laying golden eggs and throwing it out of the window by risking our entire existence uh, by basically you know, putting a safety net out in the US economy, giving free money, subsidizing everything on earth, including the US military. Right? Basically, the, the United States is li living beyond its means. And we are risking the golden goose. So instead of pulling back, instead of allowing markets to go through normal cycles like a recession, uh, we are effectively, again, the Fed is effectively maintaining that safety net under the entire US economy, creating zombie companies just like in Japan, and not allowing capital to flow freely to where it does the most good. And the opposite of that is actually what's happening in, in crypto markets. Uh, uh, capital is very efficient. 
the velocity of money in capital market is 20 times higher than it is in the traditional economy. So which one is the fake economy and which one is the real economy? The velocity of money is higher in crypto markets. Does that imply that people with cryptos are spending more cryptos? Uh, how do you, what do you mean by that? It, it, it's not that they're spending. It's the same dollar uh, rotates 20 times faster. The velocity of uh, stable coins is 22. And the velocity mm -hmm. of the US dollar is 1.2. The that... velocity of the US dollar used to be 2.6. These are all uh, uh, numbers that are available from FRED, from the go uh, government reporting agencies, FRED.gov, I think. Yes. And you can see it used to be 2.6. Now it's 1.2. So the dollar lost over 50% of its velocity over the last two decades. At the same time, crypto assets have gone from zero to over 20x, meaning the, the dollar turns. 20 times faster, it creates good, right? So the same dollar is moving very slowly in traditional economy and very fast. It creates a lot of GDP very fast in crypto assets. That's why assets are moving or dollars are moving from TradFi, traditional finance, into DeFi and CFI. I see. Okay. We'll talk about cryptos in more detail in just a minute. I want to talk about technological innovation in the US and abroad. Uh, like you mentioned, the U.S. is spending beyond its means. You mentioned many structural problems of this country, but let's talk about uh, some of the positives. Uh, do you see any uh, tailwinds on the technology front? Do you see any technological breakthroughs or innovations or major themes that investors should be paying attention to, in particular in 2022? Well, to quote uh, Winston Churchill, he said that uh, America always does, this is on the eve of them losing to the Germans, right? They said, are the other Americans going to help us in this? And he said, America always does the right thing, but only after it exhausted all other possibilities. So we are in the process of exhausting all other possibilities. But uh, the, I think the ingenuity, the innovation, the, the again, the capital formation that the United States have is uh, uh, definitely uh, uh, separates it from every other country in the world. And I think we will do the right thing. Uh, which is enable our economy, enable our uh, uh, companies and innovation uh, to create the future of finance, reinvent finance. And that's really what the largest opportunity. This is a fight for all the money in the world, right? China is doing it with the digital yuan. Um, and the United States has to decide, are we going to create a CBDC or are we going to allow industry, companies like Celsius and others, to invent the future and maintain the dominance of the U.S. as the as the empire, largest empire in the world. Well, Alex, you've, you're, you're a tech entrepreneur. You've worked in tech pretty much all your life, uh, and now, of course, you're involved in crypto and and, uh, and uh, decentralized finance and fintech. Tell us about the attitudes of entrepreneurs and venture capitalists today versus those attitudes of the same group of people 20 years ago during the dot com era. What are they working on now that's maybe different than, uh, than 10, 20 years ago? Yes, yeah, so I always joke that I've seen this movie before, so it's a little bit easier for me uh, than others. And uh, in, when, in the birth of the internet, it was there, uh, the beginning of the internet when it kind of turned from a military project to be a commercial project. And uh, we were trying to solve all the problems in the world, kind of similar to what is happening right now in uh, you know in crypto where we're trying to attack everything but it it, it ended up that the, the internet was only good for a few things and uh, if you look at the largest companies in the united states today i think most of them are one or another uh, internet businesses if it's amazon or if it's uh, apple or if it's google or microsoft and so on so the same thing is going to happen with uh, this wave of innovation right so the blockchain decentralization uh, is only good for very few things, right? And we know Bitcoin, for example, is good as a store of value. Uh, uh, yield, you can create yield or interest income on the blockchain uh, in a much better and free way than you can in a traditional financial system. And now we're toying with DeFi and NFTs and all kind of other stuff, right? Okay. But it's going to be, there's going to be a very few winners. Uh, anyone who expects 100 companies to come out of this uh, has to watch the first movie again, where we had basically fangs, five fangs, 
uh, win the entire internet. I want to talk about some of the emerging themes and or, or emerging uh, uh, trends, Web3 being one of them. Uh, just today on the 20th of December, Jack Dorsey caused an uproar on the internet by making this statement on Twitter. Uh, let me just read it. He said, you don't own Web3. The VCs and their LPs do. It will never escape their incentives. It's ultimately a centralized entity with a different label. Know what you're getting into. Okay, lots to impact there. What do you make of that statement? Well, look, I, I don't think necessarily that VCs are good or bad. Uh, VCs uh, are deployers of capital and they usually chase opportunities where capital can do good and can return a lot on its assets. I think Jack is focusing on decentralization. He's basically saying don't allow decentralized entities to control mm -hmm. you. If you're an innovator, try to build these things in a decentralized way. But even if you're building in a decentralized way, you still need capital. And a lot of this capital formation, the fastest capital formation is coming from uh, venture capital. And uh, that's why uh, they basically get in on many of these uh, early stage projects. But for example, Celsius was not funded by venture capital. And I think Jack is planning to, all the stuff he's developing with Square and others, other projects are not going to be venture uh, backed. So it's a combination of both. And really, this is all about the user, right? The, the billions of people around the world voting with their pockets for companies that are decentralized companies that are acting in your yeah. best interest, like Celsius, versus uh, companies that just create some uh, novelty for you, which is, again, uh, a punk, an NFT, uh, uh, you know, uh, a DeFi project or whatever. So uh, the question is, are you going after the short term um, um, appreciation or are you trying to build the future of finance? Okay, well, that's one of the things that I think are uh, different or is different now than versus uh, the, 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 the uh, tech tech era of 1999 uh, is the um, back then during the dot-com boom and bust, uh, there weren't as many options for fundraising as there are today. Today, we have a plethora of different fundraising options, not just VCs like you mentioned. Tell us about how a young entrepreneur or an engineer can raise capital in a decentralized manner today. Yeah, you're, you, David, you're 100% right. It's, it's not just that uh, there are many ways. For example, there are many different uh, capital formation, like, for example, a DAO, uh, Distributed Autonomous Organization, where a bunch of people just get together and they fund this project that is autonomous, right? It's not uh, a really co a traditional corporation. You can do a, a, an ICO, an initial coin offering, like Celsius did. Uh, you could still go to VCs or private equity guys. Uh, but you can also basically get your community to come and back you up. Like we at Celsius, we used uh, several rounds with the community where we explained to them what we're going to build. They funded the project, and then we delivered that utility back to the community. So the community is the main beneficiary from creating this infrastructure. But also the, the other side of the same coin here is the, the amount of code or the amount of development that you need is dramatically lower. Right, so so where in some of the like uh, Arbinet, the company I founded in uh, during the internet boom, uh, we had to raise three hundred fifty million dollars before we went public uh, to fund the infrastructure build out to f build voice of IP, put nodes all over the world, and so on, so on. Today, uh, an eighteen year old kid can write few lines of code, relying mostly on existing infrastructure, right, forking existing uh, work done by. Uniswap or by some other uh, protocol, adding some value to it and create the future of finance. So the need for that massive amounts of capital just does not exist, right? So you can deliver much more with much less. Mm. And again, it comes down. Are you trying to do good first and then do well? Or are you just trying to do well? Okay, excellent. Well, what does all this innovation mean for the crypto markets next year? We'll move on to your outlook on the crypto markets at large in 2022. So I, I, you've, you've been asking me that question now for several years, and, and I've been an optimist uh, uh, throughout that period of time. I, I, I don't think, uh, I think the, both the Fed and Treasury are really locked in a vice. They're, they don't have a lot of options. They're behaving as if they're options. They're, they're telling us, they're telegraphing us that they're going to do this or that. But the reality is that, that 
they're going to support the economy. They're going to continue to reflate. And because of that, uh, sooner or later, uh, both Bitcoin and gold are actually going to rip much higher because uh, basically people will understand that they're getting taxed and then debased. You know, And we talked about that during the debate. Uh, that's one thing I totally agree with Peter Schiff and others, that there's no question that the traditional system, TradFi, is penalizing you several times. And there's no way for you to escape that unless you detach yourself from being denominated in US dollars. So Bitcoin, I expect it to rip higher again, 140 to 160,000 next year. And I expect gold to go much higher than 2000 and stay above those levels. Mm -hmm. When people realize that those are the real only two assets that are not connected to that, uh, to the mothership, which is uh, the dollar. Um, final question on cryptos, and uh, we'll end it there. Now, Bitcoin, I, I've talked to uh, several entrepreneurs working in uh, uh, the transactional space of DeFi, and uh, they've been telling me that Bitcoin is still the coin that's being transacted the most with. The, the largest volume of trade is still being done with Bitcoin. Do you see that changing in the, in the foreseeable future? Could something like USDT or USDC uh, take over as the predominant currency of choice in the crypto space? Well, it depends how you measure these things, right? So if you measure it by number of transactions or dollar value, uh, but I, I do expect today a lot of the other projects like Ethereum, for example, are capped because of the gas fees. So the gas fees are 10 times or 100 times higher than what they should be. And the minute we solve all that next year, uh, you're going to see an explosion in the number of transactions on Ethereum. Today, a lot of people who are trying to transact on the Ethereum blockchain have to stop themselves or try to do it later. So uh, Bitcoin still has a dominance mainly because of all these obstacles, right? But if you look at the uh, daily volume of Tether, you would see that uh, uh, the Bitcoin uh, Tether pair uh, uh, plus the Ethereum Tether pair are really the ones, the two that have the most volume. And Tether does three times the volume or two times the volume of those two together. So, so today, if you do, if you measure in dollar terms, I think uh, Tether would win out. Uh, but if you measure in absolute, like how many blocks or how many transactions in a block, obviously uh, Bitcoin uh, and Ethereum still win. Excellent, Alex. I appreciate your insights. Thank you for your outlook for the following year and uh, happy holidays. We'll speak to you in the new year. Same to you, and we'll see you in 2022. We'll see if, if our predictions came true. Well, you've you've had a track record of being right so far, so I don't see why you wouldn't be right again. Uh, good luck uh, to all your endeavors with Celsius, and we'll talk more about Celsius next time. And thank you for watching Kitco News. I'm David Lin.